Contact tower at 118.5. Goodbye. 185, Radio 117, when localizer established, descend ILS, maintain 180 knots. Well, establish a localizer, descend on the ILS, and maintain 180. Radio 117. It's 3, turn right, heading 245, establish on the localizer, 27 left. Right, 245, establish localizer, 27 left. Um, hello, everyone. Sorry, Chris, good evening, 81. This... Good evening, 27 miles, runway 27 left, reduce speed now, 180 knots. Um, that was a video um, that's on YouTube, you can find lots of them. It's uh, Air Trap Control at London Heathrow. Um, I just wanted to play it because, you know, just to get you into the mood of, uh, of being around aircraft and aviation, um, if you're not used to that sort of thing. That is obviously before the pandemic because there's airplanes in the sky. Um, there's not so many now. Um, you can see them all streaming off of the, uh, the holes and they do a big S turn over central London and descend and land into London Heathrow. Uh, you can hear the air trap controller. Um, I think her name's Jane. Um, we never really get to know the names, but I visited and I heard the same voice um, down at Swanwick at London uh, a few years ago. Um, she's super calm. The world could be falling apart, it could be fog, there could be aircraft emergencies, and her intonation of her voice never ever changes. It's always calm, and it just makes us warm and fuzzy inside to know that if they're calm on the ground, we can be calm up in the sky. But I'm here today to talk to you about um, building a flight simulator and how you know, I got involved with the team of engineers. Um, uh, I worked for British Airways as an airline pilot and how we built this flight simulator um, using .NETs, IoT and, uh, and the tools that we all know and love as developers. A bit about me first though. I'm an airline pilot. I get to fly the 787 around the world. I got back from Washington last week and um, I've got no flights in December because, well, no one's buying tickets. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've got most of December off. Uh, I think boxing down off to Hyderabad uh, in India, um, which I love. It's fantastic food there and uh, wonderful people. Um, when I'm not flying a plane, um, you'll find me huddled over my laptop somewhere in a coffee shop down route somewhere um, or at home. And I'll be working on .NET, uh, mostly in the mobile space, the Xamarin and, uh, and Maui, as it will be in the new year, and uh, IoT as well. So I love playing with electronics. That's because I spent 12 years working in the car industry. Um, before becoming a pilot, so I work with robotics and PLC programming. Um, you can read the rest about my, 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 uh, my passions of you know, helping people, um, doing code camps in schools when we were allowed to do that before the pandemic. Um, hopefully that will come back in the new year. Um, that's enough about me. Let's talk about this simulator. I got involved. Uh, I, this simulator goes out to, to air shows and corporate events um, around the UK and Europe. Um, it gets around quite a bit. And I got involved, I was volunteering as a pilot, so all the pilots that go along with this simulator, all volunteers, on their days off, we go along in uniform and you know, we entertain the crowd at the air shows and give them the experience of, uh, of coming into our world. Who remembers a programme years ago called Krypton Factor? Yeah, I think you kind of need to be in the UK. It's a UK show and part of that, they always used to take someone into it, the full flight simulators that we train in um, every six months. My check is uh, next week, end of next week. I go in and I have to hand my licence across to the training department and, uh, and hopefully after two days of being checked and examined, they sign the box and give it back to me and I can go and fly passengers again. So every six months as an airline pilot, we hand our career to the training department and we have to pass this exam. If we fail, then we're not allowed to fly passengers. Um, so then we get remedial training to get us back up to standard and hopefully they'll sign the box eventually and we'll get to go back to work. Um, so that's kind of you know, how much we're checked and trained. But um, I went along to this event at um, the uh, Goodwood Festival of Speed and the, it, they, the, uh, the computers had all fallen over, it was all broken. Um, I was fairly new to the airline and the, the team that were leading it was saying, the soon broke, been trying to call you, couldn't get through. Um, and you know, it turns out that one of the Dell PCs in the, the bottom here, um, the graphics card had come out when it was uh, travelling there, but no one knew how to fix it. So I said, oh, I know a bit about computers, I'll see if I can fix it. And 10 minutes later we had it all running and saved the day. Awesome. About a week later, it was at another event. I got a phone call from someone who was there. It was at the previous one. said, oh, Cliff, that, that problem's happened again. How do I do it? So I talked them through how to take the computer apart, put the graphics card back in. And, uh, and then from then, I got invited to, to join the team to help look after it. So teach me for, for, uh, for volunteering to help solve the problem. But you can see there, this, this simulator is pretty old and clanky, isn't it? It doesn't look very good. It's not on brand. Anyone that knows anything about brands, you know, it doesn't look very good. It's dirty, dingy. Along the, the bottom, um, it, you know, it grows moss in the winter, so we have to go and scrape it all off. Um, you know, it's dark and dingy inside. You can see, um, you know, 
in here, it's all dark and dingy. What have I done now? There we go. Um, the branding outside is not very good. Inside, it's all falling apart. We've got a couple of old Dell um, uh, XPS uh, desktops down the bottom. It's not very good. It's pretty clanky and old. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, this is it's not brilliant. It's not great. But we support this charity um, called Dreamflight. We support quite a few charities, but this is one of the main ones we support. Um, Dreamflight is a wonderful uh, charity where they take a, a couple hundred kids uh, every year, or did. Hopefully it starts again next year. Um, and these children are terminally ill, they're, they're, they're uh, disabled, they've got life-changing you know, illnesses that's happened. Um, and they take these children, they, they stick them onto a 747 when we have them, and they fly them out to Florida, to Disneyland. And um, you know, we have to raise around £250,000 to make this happen every year um, as a charity. And what that does, these, these kids go, there's no parents, no siblings, it's just them. We pack like 200 kids on board, load of doctors, nurses, you know, uh, physiotherapists, whatever's needed to make sure that child has got the support they need this two weeks in Disneyland. Um, you know, the, the, the staff at Disney are absolutely amazing um, in helping out as well. But we need to raise a lot of money. Um, and what we do, on the day they leave, the weekend they leave, we have the Saturday, they, leave, they fly out on a Sunday morning, on the Saturday they all arrive at Heathrow, one of the big hotels, depending on what year it is, depending on what hotel it is, and we used to take the simulator along and let them have a go. I was there one year uh, as a volunteer, and uh, this young girl come up in a wheelchair, and she wants to have a go at the sim. She said, I love planes, they're brilliant, they're fantastic, I can't wait to get on the 747 tomorrow. Um, it's awesome, I said, like, brilliant, let's go. We got to the step. And it's like, ah, oh, how are we going to get her in? Um, you can see this, this big step here. You can see the step up into there. You can see another step internally. You can see the gap between the seats is not very big. Now imagine taking, she was about 13, 14 years old. Imagine trying to get her into, into that seat. Now she wasn't very big, she was quite a, a, a small girl. Um, she didn't weigh a lot. Her dad was there and he was a big burly guy and he was like, well, <laughs> I'm not sure I can lift her in. You know, I can lift her, but I just don't think I can get her into the seat. Um, so they decided after about 20 minutes that she couldn't have a go. Um, so she was like really upset, you know, on the verge of tears, but what could we do? But her brother could have a go. She was fully able. So he jumps in, has a go, comes out, massive beaming smile, you know, big sticker says, I've, you know, visit the flight deck, you know, wearing the captain's hat. And he comes out, and what do siblings do? You know, he's upset that his sister's off to Disneyland. He's not going. He gets to stay in the UK with mum and dad for two weeks, respite. Um, but he's not going. So what do you think he's going to do? Well, obviously, he's going to show off. I had a go. It's brilliant. It's fantastic. It's really good. No, 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 no. She bursts into tears, as you'd expect. She's really, really upset. And it almost, not ashamed to say, bought, nearly brought me and some of my colleagues standing there into tears as well, because we was like, this just isn't right. And I think to myself, well, well, brands and marketing don't want to use the simulator anymore because it's not on brand, it doesn't look very good, it doesn't sell the airline. And now we've got, you know, we support a children's charity with disabled kids and we can't let them have a go. That's not right. Let's, let's fix this. I'm an engineer. Let's get this done. So as you can see, you can see the step, you can see the, 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 the padded bit we need to put at the top to make sure people don't bump their head because they have to duck into it. Um, this is an old FMPT2 trainer, which is what... Um, you learned uh, as a simulator in light aircraft, so it's really dinky and small. At the time, the airline had just got A380s. And this is what the cockpit of an A380 looks like. Did anyone notice there that, unlike uh, most jets and what most people think, you have this big control yoke, don't you? Well, here they have joysticks. We just got these A380s. I was an Airbus pilot at the time, flying around Europe in, on the A320s. I looked so joysticks, dead easy to connect to a PC. Literally just plug it in, job, job's good. And, and we're sorted. Um, you know, we get some screens, we'll put the graphics up on the screen. It's an A380, it's big, everyone wants to have a go. It's going to be fantastic. But I went to a meeting with the sales marketing team saying, Look, pretty please, give us some money, give us a budget to build this. And um, surrounded by um, all the sales marketing, and I was like, but, but planes don't have joysticks. They have that big, that big steering wheel. So no, no, they have joysticks. No, no, they have a big steering wheel. I bought a picture up on the internet. No, 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 it's fake. You know, <laughs> I'm like, you know, we've got 200 Airbuses flying around Europe, all with joysticks. Nope, don't believe you. So we took them into the simulator to show them an Airbus A320 sim. And they're like, Is this, do they really have joysticks? Like, yeah. But then it, it clicked. Well, if the sales marketing team don't believe that aircraft fly around with joysticks, is Joe Public that comes to an air show going to believe? Or are they going to think, well, this is a fake, they've just done this to make it easier in the simulator? 
So I was like, okay. We just ordered a load of uh, Boeing 787s. I'm a 787 pilot. I'd just been awarded the, uh, the course. So I just found out that you know, later that year I was going to go and train to be a 787 pilot. Yes, get in. Um, going to fly around the world. Rather than just visiting Europe, I'm going to visit further afield. And this is what a 787 flight deck looks like. I said, okay, well, everything's fairly easy. We've got screens. We can you know, project the images up there uh, and that. But that control yoke, that's, that's, that's the head scratcher that is. How are we going to solve this? And we had the, the whole control yoke in the old uh, simulator, but it was just it just didn't work. Um, you know, you, you kind of pulled it, and it just you know it was connected by rubber bands, and just yeah, well, it was nasty. Um, so it's like, well, we can't have that. Let's make it better. So again, here's our simulator. It looks tired, it looks old. So we started off with just completely stripping it out, emptied everything. Yeah, you know, completely empty trailer. You can see there, uh, I'm working away with. Uh, we've got our apprentices, engineering apprentices involved. So it gave them a project to work on. So again, we're putting back into the business of, well, let's get these engineering apprentices involved as well. And then got them to build um, the the new simulator. You can see there, we're, we're starting to build out the. The uh, apprentice leaders, um, the, um, Dennis is one of them there, um, is you know, making sure the apprentices are learning skills from doing this as well. So it's quite a good, fun project. You can see Dennis is having lots of fun there, um, down the bottom. Um, that's an old uh, throttle quadrant, so the, the, the throttle levers out of 747 that had just been retired. Um, and obviously the throttles on the 747, it's got four engines, the 78 has only got two, so we had to cut it in a half. Um, and I said to Dennis, we need to make this two rather than four. Massive smile, he's got this big nine-inch angle grinder out. He's like, I can make that happen, Cliff. <laughs> um, yeah, he was a bit too eager. Um, you can see there, he's putting it back together after cutting it in half and had lots of fun. Um, but we got the apprentices to, to, to get some sheet metal and cut it out and, and you know, uh, get all the screens and that connected. And that's what it looks like now. So we got the apprentices in our marketing team to design the marketing around it as well. So now it looks fantastic. It looks really good. Um, you know, inside it looks like a 787. Um, the two seats you see there are out of a retired 767, because um, we were retiring those at the time. So we took two of those out. So now the proper aircraft seats, rather than the Iveco truck seats that were in there before. Um, so yeah, this looks, this looks smart, doesn't it? This is great. But how do we build it? What do we do? Well, you know, inside um, we had the, the simulator laid out as well. Um, you can see there uh, in the top left, uh, you can see we built a ramp, so there's now full wheelchair access. So now the, you know, a young girl could come up and wheel up into the simulator. You can see there the, uh, the, the darkened one over to the right, and um, you can see this seat here is on a rail, so it moves all the way back. So it's about two metres away from flight controls, which means they can go in with their wheelchair around the flight controls straight up and they can have a go. You can see the young lad in the bottom left there was at that year's Dream Flight event. He was in a wheelchair. He was so short he couldn't see out the window. So he really was flying on instruments. But he absolutely <laughs> nailed it. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, I couldn't get a picture. Um, but at that event as well, there was a young kid and I had no idea how he did it. He had no arms. Like literally nothing. There was nothing there at all. Um, and uh, he came in and he flew this thing. He couldn't see out the window. And he just put his feet up, he flipped off his sandals that he had, put his feet up, curled his feet around the control column and flew this approach. And I'll tell you what, you know, I wouldn't even go in the sim the following week and do it for me, for my check, because it was absolutely perfect. And it's like, how do you do that? You know, the human body, the adaptability that you have as a human, if something goes missing, to replace it, um, is just phenomenal. But that there, that was, that was fantastic. You know, we built this simulator, it's awesome. The kids can now have a go. We can take to events. Sales Market now use it for, for promotional events. And we can raise a lot of money to help Dream Flight and High Flight and the other charities we help, like London Air Ambulance, etc. But now you're sitting there thinking, Cliff, we're at a tech conference. You know, I want to know about the tech. Yeah? I don't want all this geekery about what we've done for the charity. So let's talk about that. This here is um, the system layout. Um, diagram for the uh, for the sim. So you've got your control yokes, they feed into an instruments PC which controls all the instruments. You can see in the top uh, top right there, um, you see Captain PFD, FO uh, PFD. PFD stands for Primary Flight Display, so that's the main display we use to display the instruments, altitude, heading, um, so altitudes and speed, etc. And then the ND is a navigation display which shows your heading and you know the airports around you, etc. etc. And then the, the, the center CDU is central display unit, which is the one that sits down in the, in the bottom there and displays things like engine instruments or a checklist or uh, a flight management computer, etc. 
have an instructor's PC, which is uh, the one where the pilot who sits in the right-hand seat and controls the world has a touchscreen. And one of the problems with the old simulator is it was old Microsoft Flight Sim. Um, Flight Sim 98, I think it was. It was proper old. Um, and when they wanted to restart the flight for the next person, they had to go back into the menu um, and click new flight, etc., etc. And it took five or six minutes for the next person to jump in and have a go. And when they wanted to zoom back to four miles, let them have an approach, they had to click around a load of buttons in menus and stuff, and it was, it was janky, it wasn't very good. So we wanted a touchscreen, an, an instrument PC, or instructor's PC, that can actually just automate all that, just like it does in our full motion sims that we train every six months. And then we needed to have the external view. Um, so we had three projectors, classroom projectors, which are short throw, just like this one here. Um, so it sits really close to the, uh, the screen. They sit up in the ceiling and project out um, to give us that view that we had before. All connected with uh, some software called WideView. And then we have a 4G connection so that when it does break an event and there's not someone like me there that knows how it all works, the engineers back at base can connect in over um, remote desktop and control the PCs and sort the problem out. Obviously, if you, the graphic cards come loose, they, they can't do that. But what we did was worked with a, uh, an external company called Future Software, and they built us some bespoke computers where that sort of thing doesn't happen because they're all properly glued in and do all sorts of funky stuff to make sure that the, 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 the tech survives being battered along the road. Because Barry, who's our tame racing driver, he used to actually be a racing driver, um, speed bumps, don't care, he'll hit them at 60 mile an hour. Um, so, you know, we tried to calm him down, but he just, he just, you know, he wants to get there because he only has one mode, which is fast. Yeah, he's always late, I don't get it. <laughs> so anyway, um, back to the flying controls. How are we gonna do this? So we took out the um, the, the control columns. We, we got Dennis and his angle grinder again to go out to the 747 that was on the scrap heap and he ground off the, the, the control column. And we welded it onto this setup we built here. Um, you can see we've got some nice big bike chains, and then we've got these two motors. And on the end, you can just about see a little black box on the end of each of those. They're encoders. Uh, encoders, if you don't know, um, they just basically take a uh, rotary position and, and send that feedback into a PC. Um, BFF Simulation um, is a company in the UK, and what they do is they build simulators for racing cars. So think Formula One and uh, touring cars, etc. So they build um, uh, all the kits to make racing car simulators, but their kit, it's just the same, because if you turn the steering wheel left and right, or you push an accelerator paddle, there's no difference for us. You know, we've got an extra pitch, so left and right, and we go forward and backwards for going up and down. So we contacted them, reached out to them, and they sold us some driver cards, um, which allowed us to control these motors and encoders, and it means that we can take that signal straight back into Flight Sim, um, and then control the motors. So now we've got a motor, and you're thinking, well, why do you need a motor? Well, now we've got force feedback. So when you roll on bank and you pull pitch, Obviously, you load the wings. You know, like in a real aircraft, you can't really pull it too hard because the wing loading is so heavy that you know, you, you know, you're struggling with your muscles. Um, so we wanted that in the, in the simulator, so it felt realistic. Um, so that's what we got with using this. How do we connect up all the, uh, the buttons in the simulator? You can see um, this board here, a company called Leo Bodnar, again from the car racing simulator. Um, Barry, our team racing driver, puts in contact with these companies. Um, so. Lira Bodnar board there, they're about £30 each, and that basically takes, um, it turn, it's basically a keyboard. So when you plug it in USB, it appears as a keyboard to your, your PC, and you can just plug switches and sensors in. So if you ever want to work on something where you need that kind of, you know, build button, you know, that big flashy build button, you can just use a Lira Bodnar board and just plug it in. Um, they've got ones as well um, that do uh, joysticks, so you can plug in a, 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 a tensiometer, um, like a variable resistor and then you can use that to, to feed in as a joystick controller as well. So they've got some stuff. But there's things we also wanted to do, like flashing lights and sounders and things like this. Well, they're all input devices. There wasn't anything that outputted. I'm an IoT developer. I like working with uh, Arduino. I use a lot of these boards from Tinsy, from PRJC, American company. Fantastic boards. It's a Cortex uh, uh, M7 chipset that's on there. Um, you can write in Arduino C and, um, you know, it's 600 megahertz on a little board that's yay big. Um, you know, it's bonkers how powerful it is. 32-bit, um, it's, you know, it's fantastic. And they're about sort of 30 pound each. So they're not expensive. So we've got a couple of these and they control things like the lights that are inside the simulator, buzzers, warnings, that sort of stuff. Um, and we've wired these all up and, and, and wrote software. And all they do is they connect back to the instruments PC, 
and uh, over the, uh, the serial bus, uh, which is UART control, um, we send signals back to um, a bespoke bit of software that I've written in .NET that just talks to it over the serial bus. Um, so we can control the light. So we take a signal out of flight sim, we process that and we send it down to the board, turn that LED on, turn that LED off, that sort of thing. The other software we use in this, just in case you want to go and build your home simulator in your bedroom at home, because you know, you're stuck there, you might as well have some fun while you're stuck in the office um, at home. And you don't really want to work on that project, do you? You want to play flight sim, don't you? So um, at the time when we initially built this, uh, we had prepared 3D, uh, which is from Lockheed Martin. Um, they bought Microsoft Flight Sim when Microsoft had had enough of it. And, and basically, they're up to version 5 now. Um, see, this slide is actually a bit older. Um, and they uh, basically effectively rewrote most of it. Um, and they use it in their full motion simulators for things like the F-16 and stuff like this. We use Orbix, which is the visuals. We can see 2.7 there. That's London City Airport. Um, Quality Wings, um, a group of um, aviation enthusiasts wrote um, a 787 model um, for um, prepared 3D as well. Um, wide view, remember I said earlier, all the three PCs need to be connected together to share the world model of what is going on. The aircraft is this altitude, that bank angle, this speed, etc., etc. Wide view shares that across the network. And then we've got this Pete Dawson's FSUIPC, Universal Interprocess uh, Communication. Um, and FS is for flight sim. And what's that? Well, if anyone, does anyone know what that is? Has anyone used that at all? Any, yeah, we've got someone at the front. Yeah, awesome. Um, if you've written for it, you know, what it does, uh, UIPC control, in the process control. So you have your flight sim, uh, which is prepared 3D in this case, which is your process one. You have your instructor's IOS, instructor's operating station. Yeah, it's not IOS as in Android, uh, 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 phone, uh, Apple. Um, you know, iOS was around way before Apple. Um, that's process two. And what it does, it has a shared memory block in the middle. So FSUIPC looks into the flight sim process, grabs out all the data, and exposes it to any other process in this shared memory block. Um, you've got um, 65 kilobytes um, there, and it's all done in, in bytes. And um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, a, it's not brilliant. But it does mean that if we want to change the process one, um, and we've done this, don't we? We abstract our databases away to the nth degree, so that when we want to change our, our SQL database to, I don't know, Cosmos DB or, or to uh, you know, MongoDB or wherever it is you want to change it, because we, we have that design criteria, don't we, in our, in our, in our back-end systems, that we, one day we might want to change that database. Can I have a show, show of hands? Who has ever changed a database? Yeah, we've got a couple of hands. Yeah, there's probably a really, really, really good reason for doing that. Um, but was it easy? I'm getting a shake of heads from everyone that put their hand up. Yeah, it wasn't easy at all. It's not that sort of thing you just, you know, you just change. So, you know, you, abstract, you spend all that time and effort abstracting away, but then when you want to change, which is exceedingly rare, as we can tell, um, you have to put a lot of time and effort in anyway. Well, this was great. Microsoft Flight Sim came out, and we was like, I wonder. So we literally loaded it on one of the machines in the office, and FSUIPC looked in. The same memory mapping was there. There's a couple of subtle changes, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. And it worked. So now we've got Microsoft Flight Sim. How cool is that? Which means that we get these sorts of visuals. This is a 787 model from Quality Wings, taken off at London Heathrow, 27 right. And look how good that looks. I mean, that is better than the flight sim that I'll do my check-in next week. Um, it's just so, so, the fidelity is there, it's just so good. Um, you know, even the sun glare and everything else, it's, it's just, you know, really, really good. So this is the instructor station we built. Now, as a pilot, I'm a bit techy, which is why I'm here. Um, but most pilots are not. Most pilots, you know, you need to, to kind of point them in the right direction. So we want to give them big fat buttons to podge. But, you know. <laughs> we want to make it super, super, super simple because even an iPhone for some is complex. Um, now I'm not saying pilots are stupid. Um, you know, we're highly trained individuals. But sometimes when you put something new in front of them, we don't want to have to go and do a type rating that show them how to work this. We just want any pilot that pisses up on the day to be able to just literally look at it, it's intuitive, oh, I can see what that does. So these buttons are very similar to the ones that we have in the instructor station in our full motion sim. There's a takeoff button, there's a 4NM, stands for nautical miles, and there's an 8NM. So if you press the 4NM, nautical miles, it will position the aircraft in the right altitude, right position, right body angle, right velocity, um, et cetera, et cetera, for a four mile final to land in at the airport. And that's it, and then we have a pause button, you know, to, to pause the sim. 
et cetera. So this is what we, we, we come up with. We drew this on a bit of paper and said, right, that's what we're going to build. Nice and simple. How do we do that? Mentioned FSUIPC. That looks a mess, doesn't it? Let's look at it a bit deep, a bit more detail. Here you can see, um, this is the, that list. Remember I said that, that big uh, bo block of memory that he exposes. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, hex offset. So it starts at zero and counts up. And then you've got your, your, um, the, the next uh, column along is one, two, and four. That's how many bytes. Um, and then the next uh, the center column tells you what is um, controlled in that, uh, in that byte. And then the last two are explaining where it's been tested, what simulator it's been tested on, um, et cetera. We look a bit more detail into this, though. Um, so we break it out. So if we look at the, uh, the bottom left there, we've got an interposition. So that's just a little bit easier for brains to work rather than hex. Um, so it's 3,144th memory location in. Um, is the nav1 lock. Now lock is the localizer. And we'll explain a little bit more what that is uh, later on. And then we've got nav1 GS, which is the glide slope. So that is there. Um, how about something different? Nav1 signal strength, because you might want to expose that in your, in your simulator you're building in your bedroom, because you're all going to go home and do that, I know. Yeah. You, you're saying I'm not, but I know you're going to. Um, that's, that's four bytes, but it's only controlling uh, uh, 0 to 256. So why is it four bytes? Well, that's because in later versions of SIM, like Microsoft Flight Sim, they also expose the, the VOR, um, which is a, basically a, a, a direction beacon we use for navigating around the sky. We did. Back in the day, now we just use GPS like you do in your car. Um, but that goes naught to a million. So, you know, even way back when FlightSim was first invented, um, you know, by Microsoft years and years ago, they were starting to think about, you know, these bits and they built it into the memory map, but they just never exposed it at the time. And now they're using it. So how cool is that? Forward thinking. But we're dealing with hex values here. And if you're writing, normally you write code to work with FSUIPC and C, uh, and C++, which is, you know, it's all right, but I'm a .NET developer. I don't really want to get down the weeds with that. Um, I do do it for IoT, but it's different there. Um, so there's this wonderful um, DLL, um, a .NET DLL by Paul Henty. Um, it's fantastic. Um, it's free um, to go and download and use. Uh, obviously, you know, you can support him by um, sending him uh, a, a bit of money on one of his uh, support things there buy them a coffee, that sort of thing. Um, this is fantastic. This means that now, instead of dealing with all those offsets, etc., we can just use a .NET client. Awesome. How cool is that? Now, I know you're all .NET developers, or, or maybe you're not. I don't know. Um, but just a reminder of, of a bit of uh, basics about, um, about memory and how much is used. You know, uh, uh, signed by it, by it short. You can see the values that are there in red. I'm not trying to teach at suck eggs. It's just reminding you that you might have forgot this since your college days. Um, because typically, when we write code, it's an int, a float, a double, and that's it. We don't care about anything else because we've got so much memory. We can just use it. Um, so this is just showing the, uh, the types that we can use in our .NET code. Uh, you can go out to the docs.microsoft, awesome resource, and read more about that if you really want to. Um, good bedtime reading. But let's look at this now. So we want to put the gear up and down. Yeah, so we want to control that from a switch that's plugged into our, our boards, our little Arduino boards, which is then fed back into, um, back into the instructor station. So we move the gear lever, we make the switch, it then connects via our IoT boards, via the serial bus back into the instructor station, and then the instructor station wants to say, over the network and wide view to the main flights in PC, we want the gear to go up or go down. Yeah. We, remember that big red pause button? We want to pause the sim, unpause the sim. Well, now this is our code. So we have an offset. Uh, we have to, it's, uh, you, you see there, it's uh, an unsigned int or a, a short. Um, so we use the offset. We put the offset in brackets, and that's it. Now we have the ability, pause control, value, 0 and 1. And that just pauses and unpauses. How cool is that? We can all write that code, can't we? Yeah, easy. Um, if we go across to Visual Studio, you can see here that um, this is not the actual code that's in the sim, um, but we can just create some, some controls at the top here. As you can see uh, here, it's just dead easy. We can even make one for airspeed as well, which is that offset. And then what we do is when the sim starts up, we start a timer. And uh, because the PCs all boot at different times, uh, we need to make sure the network's up and all connected. So we start a timer, and every second it just checks is 
the PC, the main PC that's running the main flight model available? Yes, it is. And when it is, then we start another timer, which just checks that connection um, to make sure it's stable and it's there all the time. And that is about the best way we've found to do this. You know, using timers isn't great, but it's about the only way we could get this to work that was stable enough that could survive the fact that an air show, you plugged into a big generator, and the generator is powering the food truck next door and something else, and then you get sudden brown out, and one of the PCs drops. We've got an uninterruptible power supply with big batteries in there, but you know, sometimes that decides it doesn't want to play ball either. Um, it's tech out in the, literally a muddy field. Um, so we need to make this um, pretty robust. And then you remember I said about the, um, the you, you select your airports, and then um, we have where we move the aircraft to four miles on approach. And all we do here, is we set the ILS, instrument landing system, at the runway to a three-degree slope. Most airports in the world have a, a three, imaginary three-degree slope from the runway that slopes up at three degrees. Um, airports like London City Airport is five and a half degrees, a bit steeper, that's because rich people live underneath and they don't like the noise. Um, and then we set the, the head in, uh, so the, the head in that the aircraft needs to be, so we can position the aircraft in space. Um, and that's all just set up here. Um, there's nothing fancy, it's just .NET code. You can see that. Um, you could write this code if you're a .NET developer. If you're not a .NET developer, you could work out how to write this code if you're a developer of any kind. It's not rocket science. But you remember I said to you, our sales marketing team wanted to be really involved in this. They give us some money, and one of the caveats of giving us money, they said, we want people to go away with something. We want them to take away a memento, you know, not a pen. Um, you know, not a, a, a drinks bottle. Um, I still need to do a collection of those around outside um, later. Um, but they wanted something to take away, and we was like, well, they're flying, you know, we get them to have a bit of left, right, up, down, get used to it, and then we set them at four miles, and say, right, fly this approach. This is what we do in the simulator every six months um, to pass our check. We have to fly it with, you know, all the automatics out and you know, fly this approach. Um, we'll get them to do that. And it's like, brilliant. Can we give them a certificate, you know, Top Gear? Who, who knows Top Gear? You know, yeah, you know the Top Gear board, you get a score, don't they? With a lap in there, the, um, whatever, I can't remember, the Sandero or something, wasn't it? They, they used to do a lap of the Top Gear um, thing and they get their score and they put it on the board. We want to do something like that. Um, so we put a scoring system in, but we need to score the, uh, the approach. So then we check the approach, we come down. But what is an ILS, yeah? You all come to this, I think, because you're really aviation geeks. You all love aircraft, don't you? So this is, a 787 flying approach into LAX, and this is called a Cat 3B, which is where you can't see the runway. It's, it's there, you know it's there, you hope. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the automatics flying this approach. So this is, the pilots are sitting there, and all they're doing is monitoring the system. And they hope that when it says minimums, yeah, actually a Cat 3B, it doesn't say minimums, um, when you get down to like sort of 20 feet, there's some lights in front of you, you hope. And you hope they're the runway lights and not the main road next to it. <laughs> but you fly this approach and it's, when we do this in sim, because we do this so often, practicing in the sim, and occasionally a couple of times a year we do it from real life, this is really boring because you're sitting there, it's like, come on aircraft, just do this, get on with it. Um, but when you're doing it in real life, it's like, I bloody hope that's a runway. <laughs> <laughs> but let's show you what this is. This is the LAX, hopefully the Wi-Fi keeps up with me. So this is a 787 making approach into LAX. You can see, you know, the stars and, and the dark sky above, but you can see the lights and the light pollution coming through the fog. So this is just low-level advection fog over the airport. You can see a couple of aircraft out in the distance and, then, and that. And they're coming down the approach. So they're past 1,000 feet, coming down the approach, and they still can't see the runway. It's out there somewhere below the orangey bit in the cloud. Um, you know, you can kind of see the tail light of another aircraft on approach on the parallel runway, just to the right there. So now they're passing 500 feet, and they're still not even in the fog. Yeah, there's a runway there somewhere, you hope. So now they're about to go in the fog, you can actually see the, uh, the lights uh, in front. So they dip into the fog. Now I can see nothing. You see that red flash on the screen of the clouds? That's 100 feet, still no runway. 50. 
There's lights at 10 feet. Still doing 160 miles an hour. So you're still going pretty fast, yeah? Now imagine doing 160 miles an hour on a foggy day on the motorway, yeah? Because, you know, you do that, don't you? And you want to find the exit. You're late for the, your, 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 your drinks with your friends, yeah? So you're sliding down from 160 miles an hour down to about 70 or 80 miles an hour. And you need to make the exit to get off the runway because there's an aircraft that's two miles behind you that wants to land on that runway. It's not anymore because you're not buying airline tickets. But you can see there the red and yellow lights. You can see the pilot, the, the FO is pointing them out. And then they'll, they'll follow off. They disconnect the autopilot. They should have done that about 20 seconds ago. They've, they're trying to turn the plane and the automatics is saying, no, the centre of the runway is over there. So then they realise and disconnect the autopilot. And they'll follow the yellow and green lights until they become solid green and they're clear of the runway and they'll declare that to the tower. You know, uh, speed burp, yada, yada. Uh, clear the runway. And then they'll give you instructions of where to go. That red flashy bit that I mentioned, yeah, briefly in there, you can see it was red flashy. Um, if you look at 787 or even the A350 now, um, the Airbus A350, um, they don't have beacons that flash um, like a normal flashy light on older aircraft. They have LEDs. You can't flash an LED really well. You know, I work in IT, I know this. You have to turn it on and a second later turn it off again. It's not like a flash, like a strobe, which just blinks. So you turn it on, turn it off again. That's how LEDs work. Um, that red flashy thing is the beacon of the aircraft. The fog was that dense that it's reflecting off the cloud back into the flight deck. In a flight simulator, in the full motions one that we practice in, yeah, if you um, are messing around and you crash the aircraft, yeah, you get a red screen of death. Yeah, and that's you've crashed the aircraft, you know, game over. Um, so when I first did one of these approaches, um, when we was fairly early on in having the 787, coming back into London Heathrow, we were flying down the approach and we went into the cloud and we saw this red. And myself and the captain, I'm not saying his name, both kind of jumped because we thought we was in the sim. It felt so realistic because we'd just done the sim check uh, literally a couple of weeks before together, the two of us, and we were flying this aircraft together. And we jumped because we thought that was the red screen of death and we were dead. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully we wasn't and we landed. But we've, I've done countless number of these Cat 3 approaches they're not normally as bad as that. It took some while of uh, searching around to find this. Um, but yeah. Oh. Move on again. So, what is this ILS thing, the instrument landing system? Yeah, it's a bit of uh, aviation geekery going on now. If you go near an airport, you'll see these antennas. So, you, the top one is uh, the antenna that sits in the center of the runway. And you will see it at both ends of the, air, of the runway. And uh, next time you go near an airport, you're going to sort of point it out to your, your family and friends who are in the car and say, I know where that is. Yeah, Cliff told me. Um, and then about 300 metres along, 1,000 feet if you're in America, because they like to do things in feet, um, you have the glide slope antenna, which is this one, this big pole at the bottom there. And what they do is they send out two different frequencies and a tone on each frequency. Back in the day, before we had you know, whizzy computers on the flight deck, the pilots would listen in the headset. And you'd have one tone, the 90 hertz on the left, and the other tone, the 150 hertz on the right. And what you'd do is you'd go left and right and left and right until the two warbly towns linked together, and all you heard was a monotone sound. Imagine doing that. You know, flying some dark, stormy aircraft into, you know, some airport, and all you're doing is relying on these tones. And you've got another one which was up and down as well. So you're trying to match these, you know, what tones are, that's that one, so it go left a bit, okay, that's that one, so it go down a bit. And you're trying to match this in a headset. I don't think I could have done that. I've been flying for 20 years. I've had a go at doing this in sim. It's impossible. Um, so we have WYSI computers that listen to that, can understand it, and then put that across onto um, the screen. So it gives us a pointer, up, down, left, right. So it gives us our, our, our pointers. And that is what we wanted to teach the kids at air shows, at Dream Flight. You know, if we go to a corporate event, we want the corporate people to come out and have a go at flying this. And that is what we want to take. So we want to take localizers, left and right, and glide slope, which is up and down, and we want to turn it into a chart. So we added this button, four nautical miles, put in the right place, right uh, air, um, point in space, the right altitude, the right body angle, etc., etc. And then remember at the very beginning, we looked at the charts and we read out these two offsets. And localized needle is left and right, glide slope needle is up and down. And it's uh, a signed byte, so it's minus 127, plus 127. So if you go out of that, you're obviously your needle's far against the edge. 
Um, in the simulator check, we're only allowed to go half scale deviation. So if you fly outside of the half scale, um, you fail your check. Like it's no if buts and maybes, you're, you're not a good pilot, off you go. Um, go and be retrained. Um, so we wanted to show that to, um, to the people having a go on their certificate. So what we did was we had the, the blue line is for the glide slope, and uh, you go outside the blue line, you fouled, um, you're not a good pilot, and the red line is bang on. And we even put a little cartoon graphic um, that we had drawn by one of the pilots of the, uh, of the aircraft coming down. And the green line is just depicted of what you're going to display as they come down. So we did that, we put it on a certificate, we print it out, so when they finish their go, it's printed out on the print site in, in nice colour. The, the pilot was sitting in the, uh, the right-hand seat as the instructor, signs it, they get given a score, we go outside, write it on the magnetic board and stick it on the board, just like in Top Gear, because everyone knows that and loves it. Um, and, you know, they get, at the end of the day, whoever's best, you know, gets given a, a gift. And uh, what we do is at the end of the year, whoever was the best score at the end of the year, we take them into the full motion sim, at Heathrow and let them have a go in a proper simulator um, that we do our training in. Um, so it's a bit of giving back as well. So everyone wants to really nail this. And typically, it's the kids that do best, um, which causes a bit of a problem because, for insurance reasons, because our simulators are airside, we're not allowed to take anyone airside that's under 14. So anyone that's under 14 that wins has to give the present to their parents, which is normally dad, because, you know, they get in there, get out of the way, you know. Um, <laughs> So yeah, the kid wins it and dad has a go, which I think is a bit unfair, but there's nothing we can do about that. Um, it's not a, a British Airways problem, it's you know, Heathrow Airport um, that, that does that to us um, because we need to be um, safe. Uh, well, I, I dare say it's just down to money, isn't it? How much they want to pay. Simulator, like I say, gets around. This is uh, the year before uh, COVID started, so it got around uh, quite a bit. Um, it goes to quite a few big events. Um, what I've left off there is all the schools. We do a lot of STEM events at schools. So we go out and we, we show kids. Um, uh, they get to come and have a go in the simulator and have a fly um, their class. And then the pilot that goes long is, is normally got a, a child at that school. Um, and they get given a, a PowerPoint pack which teaches them things like maths of, uh, of aviation, a bit of science. Um, a bit of geography, um, so it, you know it's it's a school based and it's typically a whole day event where they'll go around um, each classroom and, and talk to them about the math, science, and geography. Then the kids will go out and have a go in the simulator and practice what they've learned about you know Bernoulli's theorems and stuff like this. Um, so you know the science about around flight, and the schools love it because the kids don't realise that they're learning because they're having so much fun, and because it's not teachers standing at the front, it's an airline pilot standing in uniform. It's even better. Um, we try and get, um, it's used predominantly at schools by the female pilots we have in the, in the airline because just like in, in, uh, in developer land, um, we don't have enough females in aviation. It just, don't know what it is, just like we don't know what causes it in, uh, in developer lands. Um, but we try and entice those to come into aviation as well. And, you know, all the female pilots I've flown with, they're typically better, you know. I'm not, you know, because... As men, we have a bit of bravado. I'll get it there. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Whereas a female pilot tends not to have that bravado. It's like, I don't like this. I'm going somewhere else. Uh, and they'll typically divert earlier um, before you get down into the weeds of actually this isn't right. Uh, I'm not saying that, that you know, we're, as men we're dangerous, but we typically tend to take things a little further than, than a, a female pilot would. So um, we need more of that. Um, so if you've got a daughter um, that is, you know, wondering what they're going to do in life, um, you could send them across to us and uh, they can become an airline pilot, travel the world, see the world and get paid to do it as well, which is kind of awesome. So uh, it gets around. If you wanted to, uh, to support uh, and see what we support, these are the charities we support. So Dream Flight is the kids going to, uh, to America. High Flight is one, it's UK based. We take uh, disabled and disadvantaged kids from inner cities and stuff like that. And we take them and give them powered lessons and uh, glider lessons so they'll get to go up and just explain to them, look, your life may be crap. You, you might not you know, think you're going to do anything in life, but have you thought about a, a path into aviation? Um, and you, know, you may think, oh, I need to be the bee's knees at maths and science. You don't. You need to know your three times table and 60. 60 because everything's done in seconds. And three times table because, you remember I said that three degree glide slope? You need to be able to work out, well, every mile I'm going this far down, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not hard. We can all work that out, can't we? Um, Flying scholarship for disabled every year. Um, High Flight sponsors a couple of uh, couple of students, um, a couple of adults, uh, one female, one male, 
and they, they give them a fully paid um, PPL, which is private pilot's license. So they give them the, the training they need to go and uh, to learn to be a pilot and fly light aircraft. So again, that's fantastic. And every year we loan the simulator to London Air Ambulance um, so they can use it to, uh, to raise some money for their charity. Um, if you don't know what London Air Ambulance is, the, the, it's a charity that is basically a, 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 an air ambulance, it's in the name, um, but it's not supported by the National Health Service other than the doctors on board. Um, so they need the money to pay for the fuel, and et cetera, et cetera. So we give them the SIM and they, they get to take it to their events and use as well. If you want to help support some of these charities and if you've got a, a corporate event coming up and, uh, and you're allowed to have people gathering again, um, all you need is, uh, is to contact us and we can give this SIM and bring it over to you. Um, just need seven metres by seven metres space uh, and a 13 amp plug. Um, or the uh, C form plug as well. And all the pilots, the line pilots, they'll be on their day off and they'll come along and have fun. Um, there'll be captains and first officers and we'll get some of our cabin crew to come along as well and help control the queue and the line because it tends to get quite big quite quickly. Um, and if you want to reach out to us, you can book it here. Um, you can see we get it in tight spaces. That's at one of the hotels in London um, in, in the kind of lobby, uh, kind of atrium area in the middle. So Barry, our train racing driver, can drive it super fast but you can also get it through some, some amazingly tight spaces um, as well. And then you can be the, um, the, uh, the, the pilot having a go down the left-hand side there. And just to make sure you're an ace on the day, if you'll stick your hands out like this, you can practice in the garden, making airplane noises. Um, you know, just so you make sure you're really, really good. Um, this talk was originally designed for 45 minutes. I didn't want to extend it or make any difference because I know you're all aviation geeks and you've probably got loads and loads of questions. So I think I've got 10 minutes left um, which we can devote to questions, or if you want to go and get all the swag outside and another coffee, feel free to do that. That's it. Thank you very much. We've got a microphone over there, so if you've got a question, stick your hand up, and uh, the, the roving microphone will come and... Yeah. No difficult questions. <laughs> Has being a developer helped you as a pilot on the job? Sorry, say that again? Has being a developer helped you on the job as a pilot behind... Uh, because sometimes uh, computer systems in the plane will do something and a normal pilot wouldn't understand. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes you see things, you're like, oh my god. Um, the 787, we have an electronic flight bag that sits down on, the, uh, on the, the right hand side. And it does all our performance calculations and it's an electronic logbook that says what's broken on the plane, that sort of thing. Um, I see it once when I was delivering an aircraft from uh, Boeing in Seattle. And it was being booted completely from cold. There's no power. It was, you know, when it pops up the Windows logo, you're like, <laughs> let me off now. <laughs> but it's just a computer system that just does a bit of you know, performance. It's not connected to anything, so there's nothing that you know, hopefully could go wrong. Um, but it just shows. But it's interesting to see um, how on you know, all modern aircraft, 787 being one, is every um, system... So we've got three autopilots. Each of those has two channels, A and B channel. Each of those channels will have a different processor written by a different team. Yeah. So you know the chances of you having a bug, because we all know bugs exist. You know, we, we could lie to ourselves and say, no, this is fault-free code. We, all the tests are green. It's awesome. It's not going to crash. Send it to production. It crashes at the first user. Um, but so it's written by different teams. So you're hoping that the bug won't be replicated. Yeah. And each of those need to say, I think we should go left. All six of them say we go left. The plane goes left. Um, so you get to see that, but as a developer, it's, it's knowing that technology, um, which means that when I'm in the training team, um, I, you know, we can share that knowledge. Uh, I help train um, the, the ground systems. So when a pilot goes to learn to fly the 787, they spend two weeks on the ground um, in the classroom learning all the systems. I help as a pilot going into that team and help train the system. So as a developer, I can kind of think, well, this is how it is technically, but we need to not dumb it down, but make it a little bit simpler for those that are not technical, like myself and the rest of us. Um, and sometimes I lean on that developer knowledge to bring it across. So, great question though. Anyone else? Got one right at the very back. Uh, yes, first of all, amazing talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you think planes will ever be flown fully autonomously? Would you get one? <laughs> Good question. 
Would you? Come on. Who, uh, hands up then. Who would get on a, 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 an aircraft that the pilot's not on board? There's a few. You're all devs. <laughs> when was the last time you pushed code to production and it works? <laughs> really? As a dev, I wouldn't get on one. <laughs> As a pilot, I definitely wouldn't get on one because I've seen what goes wrong when systems break. Yeah, I give a talk, and I'm actually giving the talk in a few hours' time um, about how we as pilots um, make critical decisions when the world is going wrong around you, when the plane has broken, something's gone wrong. Um, it's later on in the summer, 12.40, I think it is. Uh, no, 4.40, I can't remember. Anyway, look it up on the, on the thing. Um, and in that, um, I talk about the fact that when things go wrong, it's us, the warm, fleshy bits that sit at the front, that make the ultimate decision on what we're going to do with the aircraft, how we're going to save the day. I talk about some aircraft accidents that happened in the past, um, like the, the Milcon Hudson, where they land on the Hudson. No computer's going to make that decision to land on the blue water, are they? No, the computers aren't going to do that. They're going to try and get back to, to the airport, to Teterborough, yeah? which means they would have crashed into a building and not only killed everyone on board, but killed all the people on the ground that were in that building. That wouldn't be right, would it? Whereas, you know, um, the, the pilots made decisions to land on the Hudson and saved everyone on board. No one on the ground was injured, yeah, and other than a checklist was round the wrong way, which meant they didn't close the, uh, the valves, the aircraft sunk. Um, it's been moved in the checklist now, so the, 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 the ditching valve isn't the last thing on the checklist because they didn't finish the checklist because they got close to the ground. It's like, we haven't got time for that, I'm landing. And that's what we do. It's like we make that decision, right, been the checklist, we've done as much as we can. Last item was to push this button, which closes the ditching valves. If you've ever looked at the back of an aircraft, you see these valves open that lets all the air and, and you know, bad smells out at the back. Um, the ditching valve closes all those holes and gets you ready for ditching on water. And they didn't push that button and the aircraft sank. I mean, it saved the day, but it's just one item on the checklist it never quite got to, because um, it's now been moved up, you know, at any point push the ditching valve and it stops it and all it does is saves the aircraft. They went and got a crane and got it out anyway. But would a computer make, could you write code that make, made that decision? I mean, AI is great, you know, but it's not that good. You know, we talk about it, but yeah. Any other questions? I do come to the talk later if you want to hear more about that. I don't see any more hands. You're either shy or we've got one at the front here. We'll wait for the microphone just so it comes out on the, for those at the back. Um, you were at the talk about the crash of the other planes yesterday, right? The MAX 737, yes, yeah, exactly. 737 MAX, yeah. I was wondering, what were your thoughts on that? Uh, it's really interesting to see an actual pilot at the talk about yep. such big plane crashes. If you didn't see this, it's a great talk to, and I, I've forgotten the, the uh, speaker's name now, is he in the room? No? Oh, no. Uh, I forgot, but look it up. It was yesterday. Um, uh, it was all about 737 MAX. Watch it on YouTube when they're released. It's a fantastic talk about how um, you know, life critical um, systems, uh, not just on aircraft, but also what we do day to day, um, could be considered life critical. Um, it could you know, hurt someone. You know, think if you work in the medical field, that sort of thing. Um, it's a great talk. As a software engineer, uh, I, I, you know, I took some things away from it. As an as a airline pilot, you know, it was interesting to see the thoughts of someone that is a doctor that works in human factors and how they piece together the, uh, the, the piece of the, uh, the 737 MAX. Um, it's quite concerning that you know, the authorities let Boeing get that far along the line of, uh, of building an aircraft where they didn't tell the pilots um, you know, as a major system that is part of the flight control laws um, on this aircraft and the pilots knew nothing. Um, it's not fantastic. You know, 787 is also made by Boeing. So when that first started coming out, we were started, you know, I've, I've got the engineering drawings on my iPad. I started looking at the system, thinking to myself, where could there be a fatal flaw in this? You know, using my engineering brain, thinking to myself, well, you know, do I trust 787? Um, but, you know, it's been flying for many years now. There's no instance of accidents that have happened um, other than batteries catching fire, but we fixed that now. Um, <laughs> But again, little things like this. Um, they talk about, he talks about, um, the, we have bulletins that are released by Boeing um, that says actually um, we, we're changing the system slightly or we've updated the software and this is now a new bug. Um, some instances come out. Who remembers the, um, the, the crash um, by Emirates into Dubai where they tried to take off again and the, the throttle levers didn't go forward as they expected them to and then they crashed and the aircraft was completely destroyed. Um, 
that changed the way we do things. When we're, we're trying to go around really close um, uh, to the grounds on the runway, it changes the procedures. So they produced one of these bulletins, it comes out, and as the, the golden rule is when you pitch up the work, you've read the bulletins that day. So you've updated your iPad, you've looked at the bulletins. On a 7.8, we're up to about bulletin number 70 now, um, and it's only, what, eight years old, nine years old? So, you know, these bulletins come out and updates, just like we have patches in our code. Um, they need to update us and tell us, right, if you see this, this is what you do. Um, and yeah, we've, we've changed that. But yeah, a fantastic question. And uh, yeah, I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Maybe another question. If not, then yeah, we've got one at the very back there. Yeah. Certainly getting your exercise there, aren't you? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you said you had flown both Airbus and Boeing. Do you have any preference? <laughs> yeah, you ask any pilot anywhere in the world, and whatever plane they're flying, it could be a, 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 a crappy aircraft that they fly around into dodgy airfields, and that is the best plane in the sky. It doesn't matter who they are, that they, they will be flying the best plane, and there'll be a reason for it. I think the 7 8 is amazing. Um, the difference is, as a pilot um, and an engineer, is I see Airbus is made by engineers, and we often joke, made by engineers for engineers. And Boeing make aircraft for pilots, except 737 MAX. Um, no, I, I jest, they fix it. It's probably the safest plane in the sky now because, well, it's been looked at with a fine tooth comb now. Um, but yeah, for me, um, having flown both, I prefer Boeing um, just purely because they, they, it's more a pilot's aircraft. Um, you've got this big control yoke. You can see what you call if I'm flying just like that, um, that um, Cat 3 approach. You can see the control yoke moving around. It's only moving a little, cause, but the automatics are doing that. So you can see what it's doing. Hold on, it's banking left. So if suddenly it decides it wants to land on the motorway and not on the runway, you can see the control yoke will, will tilt over, and you're like, well, that's not right. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, whereas on Airbus, you've got a joystick, which doesn't move. So you really, really, really do look at the instruments on Airbus when you come down on those Cat 3 approaches. So for me, I'd prefer to have the, 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 the trial. But it does, the downside of that is on Airbus, you've got a little table that pops out. So when you want to eat your dinner, you've got a nice dinner. <laughs> um, on, on Boeing, we kind of balance the tape tray on our, our lap and, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it it's, depends who you ask. If, you ask an, if I was an Airbus pilot standing here, Airbus would be awesome. So yeah, great question. One last question, maybe. We've got one in the centre. Microphone's coming towards you. I notice you're all asking questions about flying, not about dev or IoT <laughs> or anything I've talked about in my talk. It's all, yeah. You're geeks, really, aren't you? I, yeah. I always wondered when you're flying and suppose you are in an autopilot mode and you see some birds coming, what, what do you guys do? Duck. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I had quite a big bird strike climbing out of um, Milan Manpenza um, about. 12 years ago, um, climbing out of Milan, um, you know, it was quite hilly, so it's quite a steep climb. And um, I just see this black dot in front of me. I was like, what the? And by the time I thought, what the? I ducked as this big bird hit the windscreen. Um, I screamed, not shame to say, I screamed, ah! <laughs> like that. Um, and this bird spread itself across the, uh, the windscreen. And um, the captain um, burst into fits of laughter. <laughs> Because he's like, what are you screaming like? Oh. Yeah, it's like um, but then we just go into, you know, actually the training kicks in. Um, and again, if you come to my talk later, I talk about, um, I talk about uh, how we as humans have that fight, fight or flight response and about how we, uh, our inner chimp, our caveman-esque kind of response is to, to duck and run and scream. Um, but then the human kicks in a few seconds later and says, actually, you know, we know what to do here, we've got some training, we know what to do. So the training kicks in and it's like, okay, what's broken? And, you know, do we have differences in airspeed because we've hit a few birds and now the probes are blocked, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, training kicks in, you do it. But yeah, initially it was a, it was a oh my God, <laughs> what is this? Um, I've had a few bird strikes. You know, sadly, they want to be in the sky as well and we can't see them until it's too late. Um, and they don't have the traffic collision avoidance systems that aircraft have, so um, they don't get told to climb or descend. Um, yeah, you know, it's be nice if they went somewhere else, but they tend to like living around airports as well. I don't know why. So, um, but it comes back to even the, the, you know, you talk about birds. The way of making birds not be at airports is I don't know if you notice when you go to the airport next, when you're flying home, if you get to to fly home, look at things like the grass. It'll be left really tall and high, 
And that's so birds don't go down and look for, for things in the grass. You notice there will be very few trees around the airport. There will be none on the airport. Be very few, and the trees that are around the airport will typically be types where the branches are really gnarly and close together, so they don't nest in them. So all these things, and again, it comes back to the fact as, uh, as pilots and as the industry, we've learned from accidents and incidents in the past. A number of bird strikes have happened that have brought aircraft down. It's like, right, we need to fix that. How can we stop birds going there? Every airport in the world has got a bird scaring team um, and they've got shotguns where they'll fire shotgun pellets in and, and scare the birds away. Some birds don't mind shotguns. They're quite happy with it. <laughs> Who knew? Um, so they'll play um, like predatory bird sounds. So you'll see massive speakers on the top and they'll play a, 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 a distressed bird or predatory bird sounds. Um, you'll notice at London Heathrow, we've got London Heathrow, around the perimeter, they've got these balloons with owls painted on them because owls apparently scare other birds away. And they've got them dotted around the airport. And it's like, what are they for? Um, but yeah, they scare birds away. So, you know, they try their best, but, you know, I've had a few bird strikes. And yeah, thankfully it's not been too serious. But screaming like a, you know, yeah, <laughs> wasn't my best moment. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> and don't forget, I'm talking later on this afternoon as well. So come to that as well. Thank you.